essentially illustrates the modeling process with which that the EMS system assists the user in doing. So starting here at the top, um, essentially we have the natural environment and then there's a, a host of data that has been collected typically as part of some uh, study, be it uh, a circular uh, action or maybe a planning effort for water quality, just whatever the uh, underlying uh, requirements are uh, that you know, where a model is needed. So with those data, you begin to conceptualize the, uh, the behavior of the system and you start framing it here uh, by building a two-dimensional, hor the horizontal grid over the domain that you're interested in. And there's a lot of details that about, you know, the appropriate uh, methodology for doing that. We won't get into that too much today. Just um, making the assumption that we already know what the domain is that we want to be working with. Then once you kind of, you have the domain, you build this grid, you might go ahead and generate a, a simple depth averaged uh, condition so that you can test the model performance and behavior and timing. And oftentimes this is an iterative process. So you start with the grid, it, uh, domain and then you, you actually you know build the grid and refine it and uh, coarsen it or whatever is needed test it and then iterate back and do this process oftentimes numerous times and until you get an optimized grid where you're looking at the grid resolution or the, the spatial domain resolution that you're interested in and yet still computationally it's an efficient so that you can make the runs that you need to run uh, for your application. And once you are satisfied generally with the grid, then you move on to the next phase of this work where you're, uh, you know, you build the model fully out with all the capabilities that you need for the different modules and, and um, processes that need to be simulated. And then you go through this calibration uh, validation process and he, he has he, uh, many tools to assist the user in doing this and again you iterate as you go through the calibration validation process and as the outcome of that uh, process you're generating a large range of uh, calibration uh, graphs and uh, then um, you have various types of plots and, and graphs that can be uh, generated uh, where you're comparing model to data and then generating um, statistics of those um, uh, that model data comparison which be of course then these um, data and reports and plots fit very you know just are quickly and easily imported into uh, word and various uh, other word processing tools for generating your final reports. And then of course that goes back to stakeholders and you possibly may have to <laughs> iterate again, but that's, this is the overall uh, EEMS modeling framework. So starting here with the, just an overview of the curvilinear orthogonal grid generator, which is we call uh, CBL grid. So we, uh, CBL grid is a two-dimensional horizontal curvilinear orthogonal uh, grid generator that allows for building of a broad range of, of uh, grids uh, that work generally with EFDC, but the reality is, is that any um, structured grid model um, can often um, or likely could use the output from CBL grid. So CBL grid, again, is kind of optimized for the EFDC, but can be used to, to generate grids for other models that we can uh, discuss later if you have any questions. So this is just an example of the Columbia River estuary and uh, small section of the open ocean. Uh, 
of the grid. So you can see we've got, you know, the curved linear grid with different areas of, you know, grid refinement, you know, following terrain, we have islands, and all of the, this complexity is all um, built up with the CVL grid and can be directly uh, utilized by EFTC Explorer. So, kind of the, the key features of CVL grid is, is that we, obviously we can create new grids and uh, edit and modify existing grids. A very you know, useful feature, especially in this iterative process, is where we can, um, you know, CBO Grid can directly read an EFDC file and, uh, or a project, and then we can edit those, um, uh, that grid for that particular model, save it back out with all the uh, uh, settings still, you know, set for that particular model, except for the, the new grid cells or whatever that you did to edit that uh, model, and then you know, quickly be able to modify your initial conditions and boundary conditions as necessary to uh, you know, run a different uh, application. So this is one very um, robust way that you can iterate on uh, building grids and, and working with your uh, existing models. But EFD, uh, CBL Grid also works with um, a number of different uh, file formats for both importing as well as exporting uh, various formats so that we can load up other models, um, general like shape files from ArcView of a, of a grid, etc., and be able to utilize that information either as background or overlays guiding the grid process that's completely generated by CBL grid or actually as uh, grid files that then we can manipulate. So it, it has a broad range of capabilities for importing and outporting, uh, exporting uh, different kinds of formats. Then, you know, once you have your grid either created and or imported, uh, you know, there's a range of tools to manipulate it to, you know, facilitate the, a, a final grid that you want to use, including we have uh, auto orthogonalization. This can be uh, conducted on either globe. Many of these tools actually can, need, can be uh, performed on the grid, either globally on the entire grid, or you can select the subdomain and operate on subdomain by subdomain, depending upon how com complex the grid is as to which uh, approach may be uh, the most effective to use for your application. Then you can bring in bitmap images into the background, DEMs, line drawings to help when you're either constructing the grid so you can see your uh, domain in, in the uh, proper uh, uh, dimensions and, and configuration, as well as, uh, you know, just being able to uh, show the grid uh, to a client or to your colleagues uh, when you're uh, describing your grid. We have generated a large number of Publicly domain, public domain, you know, free grids that we put out on our uh, website that you can uh, go out and just you know, download once you're a registered user uh, or a registered uh, participant on our website and you know, download these grids, import them into um, our demo version of CBO Grid. You can look at them and uh, uh, with uh, you know the uh, EE tools, uh, the demo version, and anyways, you can a broad range of uh, these tools are, are these uh, grids are available on our website. So we'll look at that a little bit later. So the next component of the uh, EEMS system is the the core hydrodynamic modeling tool, the Environmental Fluid Dynamics Code, uh, which we have 
renamed as being uh, EFTC Plus since we've uh, generated and produced so many enhancements and, and revisions to the model uh, over the years that it's substantially improved over the base model of EFTC. In case any of you have ever tried to use the uh, EPA or um, GBC version of the, of the code. So originally the, this code was uh, developed at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science with funding from EPA and uh, the state of Virginia for the Chesapeake Bay uh, work many, many years ago, back in the 80s and early 90s. And then subsequent to that, um, it has basically been used by uh, and accepted by EPA as the, one of their uh, preeminent hydrodynamic uh, tools for uh, conducting TMDL studies, sediment transport studies, uh, what various water quality planning studies uh, for EPA. Um, but the EFTC code itself generates uh, flow and transport in 1, 2, and 3D, for which basically it makes it applicable for rivers, streams, lakes, estuaries, coastal waters, and open ocean. Um, it's a, EFTC is functionally equivalent to some of these other models that you may have heard of, such as the Princeton Ocean model or ECOM, the MIPE. 21 or MIPE 3 codes, the Dell 3D codes, um, et cetera. So just looking at some of the components that uh, EFTC Plus is um, comprised of. So you have your, your core hydrodynamics over here on the left, where you're, you, know, you can have uh, internally generated uh, wave model uh, coupled to your hydrodynamics, or you can uh, import external wave uh, model results into EFDC Plus. You can uh, have wet vegetation, wet and drying, which is a process of like a tidal action and a, and a, on a uh, marsh or a coastal region where cells or areas can go wet and dry based on the height of the tide, or uh, you know flooding conditions for a river. Uh, we've got uh, the implementation of an age of water, which is very nice for looking at residence times and, and uh, the long-term behavior of uh, uh, basically the, the dynamics of, of the water body. Lagrangian particle tracking with oil spill capabilities. And recently we just added uh, time and rule-based uh, control of hydraulic structures to allow for gate opening changes based on water levels or based on uh, a uh, you know some seasonal operation of, of a particular hydraulic structure on a water body. Then we have uh, a very robust water quality model for eutrophication uh, studies or dissolved oxygen and nutrient analyses, sediment transport. Uh, We've got a couple of uh, fundamental approaches for doing sediment transport inside of EFDC that are optional. One we call the original version, which is part of the EPA sediment transport effort uh, in the past. And then there's a sedzel J, which is a sed flume modified approach uh, for calculating erosion deposition processes. And that is the preferred method by EPA for conducting contaminated sediment studies. Um, with that, either one of those uh, approaches, the number of size classes is totally user dependent. You can have cohesive behavior uh, sediments and then non-cohesive behavior sediments. For the non-cohesives, you can uh, simulate bed load for both the original method, uh, as well as a Sedzel J approach. And then this is oftentimes coupled with uh, the particle um, dynamics for, the, um, for toxics, where the toxics are sorbed to your sediments. So you must understand the sediment transport and then how that impacts your toxics transport for your pers persistent organic pollutants, PCBs, uh, 
Dioxin and fur furans, PAHs, et cetera. Um, and another th um, enhancement that we have recently added to the EFDC Plus is a robust uh, uh, toxics coupling to the Sedzel J model, which uh, is uh, new as of uh, 8.3. So how is EFDC uh, plus different? This is a list of probably the, the, the majority of the significant changes, but there's a huge uh, range of other enhancements that are you know, less significant, but as are important for, for making the model more stable and, uh, and robust and they're under a number of um, hydrodynamic and uh, environmental conditions. But we have added ice formation and melt, which allows this model to be used more uh, generally in cold climates. So you can simulate uh, ice formation on rivers and lakes and, and then the melt, and then the impact associated with ice on a water body relative to uh, surface uh, processes and hydrodynamics. Um, real very helpful <laughs> uh, feature here is the run continuation so you can you can run the model and if you lose power and you, the model crashes you can just crank up the model and let it continue to run in EFDC plus and EFDC explore will will handle uh, run continuation files for you know merging and, and uh, you know, working with your uh, output files. So very uh, forgiving and helpful uh, when you're dealing with large modeling projects that way. A, a very important uh, and, uh, you know, major enhancement that we've made to EFDC is extending the, the model from a, a typical single CPU uh, application, which is what the uh, EPA version, you know, that is available out there in the uh, world. You can get EFDC, but that uh, EFDC only runs on a single CPU. So in today's, you know, computers, most um, computers have at least two physical cores and oftentimes, you know, many more, up to 32 cores and some Xeon systems. And the OMP technology we've implemented in uh, with NEFDC Plus significantly speeds up the, uh, the run times for uh, EFDC. And as I said, we have made many changes and, and continue to work with the code, testing, evaluating, improving. Uh, model stability and model performance to uh, end up with a more robust tool to be used uh, as part of our hydrodynamic and environmental simulation core of the EMS system. So now let's look here at the uh, pre and post processor for EFDC plus, which uh, we call EFDC Explorer. And this is another way to kind of look at that iterative process that we looked at in that, that circle diagram at the beginning of the presentation. But here we are looking at uh, a little bit more detail. So here you have various types of data that you, ha you have and you need to get this information into the EFDC model in a form that the EFDC model can utilize. And so EFDC Explorer can import a large number of different types of data and helps process all the data into, so that you can generate the initial conditions and generate the boundary conditions necessary for um, the EFDC model. So as it, it EE, brings in these data, processes it, and then when you're ready, you write these files out and EE will automatically generate all the files necessary 
to run the EFDC model based on the user choices that you've made. So basically some of the core are shown here. The EFDC.IMP file itself is, a, is the main control file for EFDC. The DXDY is the, uh, the grid spacing file, kind of defining the size uh, of the uh, individual cells and water depth and bathymetry. And then the LXLY file is kind of the, the cell orientation. But then uh, that the, those data are all pulled together both by EFTC in order to show all the, the, the maps that we uh, display with EE, but then EFTC model itself then will directly read these files and then operate them on them to do whatever the uh, simulation is. The EFTC plus model has been modified to generate linkage files. So as the model runs, it produces a series of binary output files that it puts into a file folder called um, hash uh, output. And uh, then EE then can read those files and then generate all types of reports, plots, and uh, analyses and produce a wide range of uh, visualization and uh, analyses that we'll discuss a little bit later. Very quickly, this is the main EFDC uh, 8.4 form. As we uh, continue to improve both uh, EFDC Explorer as well as uh, EFDC Plus, we tie very, very tightly the pre and post processing to the uh, EFTC plus code itself. So you, it's important that you're keeping track of the, uh, your versioning. We generally try to release two or more releases a year as we add new features and capabilities. Um, we just released 8.4 a couple of months ago, and we are in the process right now of building our uh, our next release. So let's just step through this uh, the use of EFDC Explorer through with a, a couple of uh, very typical processes. So let's just look at model setup initially. So again, grid development was uh, key to that. And so the way EE and EMS works is that if you've got a CVL grid, let's say you generated your grid and CVL grid, you, can, it, you could have potentially just written directly out the EFDC files when you're in CVL grid, or you can import them here as a, um, uh, a grid file and then generate your model in uh, your curve linear uh, grid model inside of uh, EFTC Explorer. Alternatively, you've got a Cartesian grid uh, option for generating all different shapes and manners of uh, Cartesian grids. And we can import uh, other grid files into EE for the purposes of generating your initial model. Now there are a huge number of parameters that need to be set as you're building an EFTC model. And in order for, uh, to make this process a little bit easier for the user, DSI has generated a uh, set of default values, which give you kind of tip, the most typical values for most of your parameters that get, that at least get you started in, in a, in a good, well-defined initial uh, condition or an initial model development uh, state. And all the uh, initial, or uh, your parameters are initialized from a file that is distributed with EEMS called EFTC.MDB, which is an access file that's locked and it contains all of our, um, these uh, initial parameter values. And this works for 
not only the hydrodynamics, but also sediment transport and uh, the toxics, RPEM, water quality, uh, and all the submodels so that you can end up with a, um, a reasonable starting condition, if you want to uh, put it that way, to begin your, your model development. So just looking at some of the output, this is a 2D plan view. Typical output where you see, we're looking at bottom elevation, displaying the grid and a few overlays of the, say the shoreline in this case and some uh, labels where we're labeling different uh, things on the uh, model domain. And so, you know, generally, you know, set up the, the entire model uh, uh, to uh, make your run. So anyways, <laughs> moving on. Uh, we need the first thing we need to do is uh, set up the, uh, once you've got the grid, you've got it loaded up into EE, you need to begin to build it. And the first thing you need to be looking at is, you know, setting up your boundary condition assignments. Generally starting with bathymetry is one of the most important uh, parameters in the 2D spatial domain. And then, then you can set up your uh, boundary conditions. Then we can do some QA, QC, and then run the model. So this is just a, a few examples of setting up the um, initial conditions. So I want to run or set up my uh, bottom roughness and uh, bathymetry and water depths. Kind of this process that you see here where you, you start with bathymetry and assign it then you, you assign your initial condition for either depth or water surface elevation. And then uh, finally, you can you know, set your in initial condition for uh, your uh, bottom roughness. And of course, you can change any of these at any time in the modeling process with EE. So once you uh, click on these, then you can, there's all a range of context sensitive options that become available based on what you're trying to set for your initial condition. And this example over here is uh, the form that you would fill out and, and provide the, the, the details that you want to uh, use for that particular parameter. Here's, uh, there's a number of different ways to assign boundary conditions. You can do it uh, more text-based in a, uh, uh, on one of the uh, utility forums, or you can come in to the 2D plan view and actually just right mouse click on the cell and you can create a new uh, boundary group and <clears throat> then edit it, as assign um, your time series to that uh, cell, etc., and fully define your, uh, your um, boundary condition from a 2D plan view map just really helps um, see what you're, what's going on or you can load in polylines and, and define cells based on some polygon that you um, have, have prior uh, defined or you can you know, generate one in EE. There's just a, a, a broad range of, op of options that are available for that. One important distinction that EFDC Explore makes with relative to EFDC plus, or, or EFDC rather, is EFDC, all the cells are unique. I mean, there's just a, a cell and series and everything has to be fully defined. But in reality, you know, oftentimes a single cell doesn't fully define a boundary condition. It's because the boundary is more like, uh, say, the river uh, flow coming at the upstream end of a river. That river may be five cells wide, 20 cells wide, whatever it is. And EE manages um, that, uh, all, all your boundaries, more as logical groups. And then, so you can apply a single river flow and then distribute that flow to all the cells uh, in a domain. So it, it just facilitates a more physically based definition 
of your boundary groups. And then this is a, a simple utility that we provide with EE that just lists all your boundary groups. And then as you look, you can you know, scroll, just click on them, directly edit them. It gives you some basic information about that particular boundary group, just as a, uh, a means of review and QC uh, for your boundary uh, conditions. And then once you have your boundaries defined, gives you the ability to display uh, your boundary conditions. This particular plot is available directly from a defined boundary by just right mouse clicking on the boundary group and saying you want a plot and it'll generate uh, this type of uh, summary for you for that particular boundary group. Hydraulic structures is, you know, are an, another type of um, uh, boundary uh, condition and I think it was 8.1 where we added hydraulic structures where you can define equations and so we have a gate structure, we have the hydraulics, we, can, we know the gate width and height and we just enter that directly into uh, EFTC Plus and EFTC Plus computes the amount of flow through the system based on uh, the uh, parameterization of the various hydraulic structure uh, hydraulic structures that you you know you've got in your in your field. And then what we've done with 8.4 is we have added the ability to change the operation of, of say a gate, a sluice gate, based on either just a, a temporal time series. So at a particular time during the year, the gate can operate at, you know, full, it can be fully closed, or it can be fully open, or it can be anything in between. And you can vary it as often as you uh, need to, or you can specify uh, a rule-based control where you're actually, you know, the, the gate operation is changing based on water levels upstream and or upstream and downstream of the, uh, of the structure. So that's a new feature in 8.4. And this is just defining uh, your sluice gate parameters that are, are used for the uh, uh, calculations and you have your for, uh, hydraulic uh, coefficients for your uh, submerged orifice flow, free surface flow, etc. So with that, and then this is just where we're defining the, in this particular case, we're adjusting the opening height uh, based on a, um, a rule that is specified here. And then as the, the uh, gate changes, we don't allow the gate to, say, operate instantaneously to a different height. It has to actually change at a particular rate. That both is realistic because you can't, you know, the gate takes a certain amount of time typically to move. And then from a numerical stability perspective, it prevents a shock to the system. So it gradually adjusts the gate uh, openings between the different settings. So that is uh, in the EFTC Explore uh, 8.4. Um, we also uh, have kind of expanded the capability of the uh, jet flume uh, boundary condition. So this is where you're linking a diffuse, uh, diffuser and a near field uh, diffuser dynamics with entrainment and uh, buoyancy and momentum uh, associated with a, 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 diff a diffuser discharge and then coupling that to the far field general hydrodynamic grid and this tool uh, or our user interface here is how you can parameterize uh, that uh, that process and it's very uh, useful for thermal flumes or any kind of uh, you know human large plant discharge where you have especially where you have density um, impacts uh, either because the material that's being discharged is more dense than the receiving water or less dense and then, of course, you also have, you know, potentially momentum effects associated with the actual uh, diff diffuser uh, hydraulic design. 
And EE has a range of these different uh, QC checks uh, throughout the system, uh, trying to uh, help guide the user to, to make you know, good entries. Um, this is something that we continuously are improving as we discover ourselves, you know, oh yes, we need to, we probably should add the, you know, checks for this uh, particular set of uh, parameters and just again, try to help the user uh, quickly get to a very, fun, you know, stable functioning model. So as far as stable and functioning, critical is being able to do the calibration validation process where you're linking the model uh, or comparing the model results to data. And we have a range of different options for uh, doing that process and speeding it up uh, for the user. We can generate uh, time series plots of model the data, correlation plots, vertical profiles, uh, plan view overlays where you can see uh, on the plan view the, the measured data and the model data simultaneously. Um, then we've got, uh, you know, the coastal uh, uh, type uh, USGS cruise, cruise uh, data collection efforts where, you, you know, you may have a day or two uh, data collection effort down some predefined path uh, for the, uh, the data crews. And then we can compare flux information, predominantly flow, but really any flux, including uh, you know, mass flux of say sediment or uh, you know, whatever parameter that's being simulated, we can uh, calculate the flux of and compare it to some measured value. And then we have the uh, model data, uh, comparison statistics that are generated, a host of different uh, model statistics. This is the fundamental main form where we're, uh, you can see the different options that are available for comparing model to data. So we got time series, the correlation, the vertical profiles, etc. And then Essentially what you're doing is, is you give it a location and then a layer approach it has to a, how to extract that data vertically if it makes sense, um, some ID, and then you point to a data file. And then with that, you, uh, yeah, the, the, some of the different uh, layer options that are available are uh, not only a specific layer or depth average, but you can also extract uh, information from the model at a, either a fixed depth, which can change obviously the actual elevation may change if tide or whatever, typically like a buoy uh, mounted sensor. So the, it's going up and down with the water column, and but the sensor is always at say a two meter depth. And then, or you can specify it like a fixed elevation. So say the sensor is attached to a, a pier and it doesn't change as the tide changes. So we have this ability to, to uh, extract data from the uh, model to be able to compare more precisely to the uh, measured uh, type of uh, measured data. And finally, this uh, blend, this uh, withdrawal BC um, boundary condition or layer condition is, is applicable for like a withdrawal zone where you know you're pulling water from a region say, you know, a couple of different layers. So we're blending the uh, concentration. So it's, it's both the value, the concentration value at, at uh, a particular layer, but also the flow rate. So you get a mass weighted uh, concentration for whatever constituent that you're uh, looking at. So these are just some of the tools um, available for the, uh, time series calibration, and m many of these work uh, uh, with the various different types of uh, model calibration tools also. The uh, number of uh, parameters that are available, and this continues to expand, but this shows you a, a list of the available parameters of, uh, for model calibration. Here's a few typical examples. This is a model to data 
uh, comparison. The data is in red, the model is in blue. We're predicting uh, the uh, Levels change, but we're extracting from a, a uh, uniform uh, depth throughout the entire period that we're simulating. Here's a uh, typical example of a cruise plot where the, the top panel represents the data collected from the cruise. The bottom panel uh, reflects the model results that correspond to both location and the time of the data collection for uh, the cruise. And then another example, this is a vertical profile plots. Um, this particular model is a Sigma, uh, Sigma Z model, which is our improved vertical layering scheme that we have generated for EFTC that allows for more uh, accurate uh, predictions of stratified systems. And then we can generate, you can have, once you've generated say a 2D plan view plot that you like the, the format, the scale, all, all the parameters, you can save out that setting and then automatically generate plots at a particular time and for a particular parameter uh, when, when, you, when the model finishes running, simply either by clicking this button or there's a new capability in EE where you can tell the, uh, EE that when the model finishes running, process all the data, all your save plots and everything, and generate a, um, a nice summary of the, uh, the model run, all saved out uh, in the, uh, the project folder. And this is a save plot form. I'm not going to get into that right now. Let's just show a couple of examples here of the types of uh, information that can be plotted. Pretty much any parameter that you know is being simulated, you can get a visualization of. Um, so just move on. This is the um, 2D plan view form. A lot of details here. I'm not going to get into all the uh, in all the specifics, but two things. Number one is that we'll be posting this online. The the webinar will be available online. And uh, plus we have other uh, training materials that are uh, available online to help uh, get more information about how to actually do these, uh, uh, use these different tools. So in this particular uh, visualization here, we can slice the, the model domain. Here we have a slice through the uh, 2D model or the, the plan view. So you can see where the, the uh, the slice is located. So this is just an example of the 2D slice uh, through that cross section that uh, I showed just a, 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 in the pre previous slide. Then we also have 3D visualization tools uh, within EE. These are all directly, all these plots that you're looking at are directly output from uh, EFTC Explorer after you know some model has been run so you can generate these animations so this example is a is a jet plume example of a thermal plume being discharged into a reservoir from a power plant so you and then we're what we're doing what you're actually seeing is a clipped version of the of the water column so any temperatures that are less than 29 degrees that water has been clipped away from this visualization. So we're just looking at temperatures over 29 degrees. Um, and then the, the color ramp that you can see here, just uh, uh, for visualization purposes, you know, ranges from white to, uh, to red at 32 degrees. So this is a, this, everything you looking at this in this 3D visualization was all completely generated using uh, EEMS. Then we have a broad range of user support as part of EEMS. We not only have you know, our website for the tool itself, but we have a knowledge base with lots of different information. We offer a demo version, and we'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, 
So here's some, we have, you know, a uh, YouTube channel for many of our uh, guides and tutorials. Uh, these webinars will all be posted on the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we have our EEMS knowledge base, and we have in-person training uh, several times a year. Next one coming up, if you want to come to uh, Dajin, South Korea, I'll be there in what, three weeks, um, two to three weeks uh, for a uh, training in Dajin. So some of our um, modeling resources, we provide access to various data sets that are widely available in, on the web throughout the world. We've got this number of grids that I had re uh, referred to before. We post, oh, I don't know, every month or so, we po we'll post a new grid typically uh, available on our website. We have test case models and demonstration models that with our demonstration, uh, well, and then the, we have our forum for both EFTC Explorer and EFTC itself. And we have our knowledge base, and this knowledge base includes the knowledge base of both EFTC Explorer, as well as EFTC Plus Theory Guide, and a CBL Grid uh, knowledge base. So there's a lot of uh, online resources for uh, the user. Now, we have, uh, with 8.4, we have implemented this um, demonstration version. Prior to 8.4, we used to release trial versions, and if somebody wanted to, you know, download a version or get our model and test it out, you know, we'd give them a, a one-month uh, free license, and they could, you know, use the tool for a month and test it, uh, you know, run it through its uh, paces. But now, we are now offering offering a free demo version of EFTC Explorer and the EE modeling system that is essentially a perpetual license. You download it, it's available, it's, you can use it uh, for, uh, as long as you want. And it has limitations. It's you know, designed so that like students can do, uh, uh, you know, small projects with, um, you know, up to 300 cells. You can build a model from scratch and any con any configuration and add um, you know salinity and and uh, hydrodynamics and you know run dye tests and do different things with the example or you can load any of our test case models and you can load it run it slice it and dice it however you'd like uh, with our demo models or you can load any model. It, uh, we have provided this new capability of the demo version so that, say, a reviewing agency wants to review what a uh, consultant has done on some project, they don't necessarily have to buy it. If all they're interested in doing is looking at the model results, uh, EE, uh, the, the demo version will, uh, can be used to load up any model and, vis and visually see it you just can't save out anything but you can see uh, what the model is you know how the model is behaving so that is the demo version and we it's available on, on our website uh, where you can download it and then we um, have all these other uh, resources uh, out there for uh, the user Actually, what I'm going to do here is I'm, let's jump over here to CBL Grid, and I'm going to just, uh, this is the main form for CBL Grid, and I'm going to go ahead and load up an, uh, an existing EFTC model as just a, a test case here. So load an EFTC Grid, and go back up. So I'm going to load up. I've got this, this is a, a, um, a small model that we've uh, developed for demonstration and testing purposes uh, for an estuary in uh, Vietnam, the Chakup estuary. So I'm going to go ahead and load up uh, the model. So here we can see the grid, and once I have the grid defined here, I can uh, do different things with it, uh, move it around, 
refine it, coarsen it. But let's say, as an example, I wanted to say that extend the grid down here um, for a river that may have, uh, you know, be um, located down below here. So I can bring up, bring in the um, back, big, uh, bitmap background image. I think it's this one. Yep. So let's say I want to bring in zoom in down to this region, um, you know, extend the model grid down here. Let's just, I can create a new spline real quick. And then um, I'll just say I wanted to, I'm, not, I'm gonna do this very coarsely. So I got one spline, then I'll create a new one. Generate the new spline, then I'll uh, do some create a region. And by creating a region, what you what you're doing is you're defining four essentially four splines that intersect one another that that follow whatever domain. And now I can generate a grid inside of that. This, uh, say trib two. Actually, these parameters are generally good. So there, I can see. What? Actually, I don't want to. Let me redo that. Yeah, I can take over from here. Um, okay. I guess I will we'll take some questions that uh, um, that we have on the chat here. So for everyone's benefit, I'm gonna repeat the questions that were asked. So the first question was, uh, can EFTC import struct unstructured grids? So EFTC uh, does not support uh, importing unstructured grids right now. It, it, is, it only uses structured grids. Um, that is probably in the future that we are. Um, so another question we had is, um, DSI announced uh, some time back that the source code is available once we purchase EFTC underscore EE. Is that for EFTC EPA version or full EFTC plus? So DSI provides a source code for EFTC plus um, single threaded for everyone um, who has bought the uh, software or EEMS. And this would be full EFTC plus and doesn't include EE or CVL grid. So it looks like everyone can hear me. Um, if you guys have any more questions, go ahead and type or raise your hand. So Paul, maybe you can take this question uh, if you can hear me. So does EFTC Plus has the function of predicting specified areas tidal height? Tidal height. Um, not exactly sure what it is that you're exactly referring to, but there is the capability of uh, EFTC Explorer to post-process <laughs> EFTC results in regions. Mm -hmm. Or maybe say uh, um, they're asking, I, I'm not sure, fully sure about the question, but maybe they're asking from Harmony Constituent whether you can create a tide or something. Um, Okay, um, that, those are the only questions that we have so far. Like you said, uh, you can both post-process results and get uh, tide elevation information, generate tight, uh, time series of a particular cell or region and do analyses of that um, time series, or you can generate uh, boundary conditions using harmonics or uh, driving the uh, harmonic coefficients for driving the, an open boundary. So if it does, you know, referring to tide levels that way, then the answer